So what I'd like to do with the rest of the time I've, I have with you tonight is talk to you about the book and talk to you about the man who wrote the book so that hopefully you get some idea of why I think this book is so special. And even more importantly, hopefully you'll come away with an appreciation for what a remarkable man Odd Nansen was. Because I think he is one of these unsung heroes of World War II that people need to know more about. So who was Odd Nansen? Whoops, there we go. This is a picture, I think I showed this, oh, I guess I didn't show this <laughs> during my preceding lecture about Fritjof Nansen. This is a family portrait, picture of the Nansen family, taken in uh, the spring of 1902. Nansen was born in December of 1901. So Ad Nansen is that young baby held in his mother's arms uh, in this photograph. This was actually, I think, uh, a uh, open house to show off the new house that Fritjof Nansen had just built there. And that's why they had a photographer there at the time. So you can see from this photograph that Ad Nansen is the fourth child born to his mother, Eva Sars Nansen, and his father, Fritjof Nansen. And of course, I don't need to go into detail about who Fritjof Nansen is because I gave you some background during my last lecture. He was a polar explorer. He was a statesman. He was a humanitarian. He was also quite artistic, um, quite a sketch artist himself. And Nansen's mother, Eva, was also a very a good artist. She was both a singer and a, a painter. I don't know if I mentioned, I don't think I mentioned this in my prior lecture, but Eva came from a, an unusually large Norwegian family of that era. And of course, many families were large at that time in the uh, early or late 19th century, early 20th century. But she came from a very large family. She was the baby of her family. She was child number 19. So that's a, that's a, that's a busy mother going there. Now, unfortunately for Ad Nansen, his mother, Eva, died when he was only six years old. She died in 1907 of pneumonia. Of course, in 1907, there was no antibiotics. There was no real treatment for pneumonia. And kind of just like uh, we've got the coronavirus, some people were able to rally and survive, and some people didn't, and she didn't. So Nansen was raised pretty much single-handedly by his father. And to be raised by the person who was probably the most famous man in all of Norway is both a blessing and a curse. It's great to be that famous and to have a famous father, but it also means that you are never really kind of uh, judged on your own merits. You're always identified as being the son of the most famous man in the country. So here's some additional facts about Adnan. So I mentioned he's born December 6th, 1901. 1927, he graduates from college. Uh, he actually went to college in Trondheim. We were talking about Trondheim before. He graduated with a degree in architecture. And as soon as he graduates, he marries his sweetheart, a woman named Kari Hirsch. In fact, the, his, his wedding anniversary is coming up in two days, on uh, August 27th. And I will be writing a blog on my website about that, uh, commemorating that. And as soon as he gets his degree, as soon as he gets married, he leaves Norway. He moves to New York City. And I think there were probably a lot of reasons why Nansen did that. Maybe he thought there were more opportunities for architects in New York. But I also think that probably one of the biggest motivators was, I think he just wanted to get out from the shadow of his father. I mean, he wanted to go to a place. After all, at this point, Norway has a population of less, you know, around 3 million, uh, 3 million people. So everybody kind of knows everybody in Oslo. I think he wanted to go to New York City where nobody knew him, nobody knew his reputation, nobody knew about his father, to see whether he could kind of make it on his own. And he was a very successful architect. He won a prize when he was 29 years old in an architectural competition. So he does this for three years. He, he has his first child. His uh, first child, Mara, is born in Brooklyn. But in 1930, he gets word that his father, Fritjof, is not doing well. He's having heart problems. He's not actually improving. And he's, in fact, slowly declining. So Nansen takes his family and returns to Norway to, to see his father, say his goodbyes to his father. And his father dies on May 13th, 1930. And at that point, Nansen decides, you know what, I don't need to go back to America at this point. I can stay here in, in Norway. And again, I think it's because this 
person who had this kind of shadow overshadowing him all this time is now gone and he can kind of be himself. And I think if we could go back in time to 1930 and interview Adnanson and ask him, well, how do you see your life going at this point, young man? I think he probably would have said something like this. He probably would have said, everything, everything looks terrific to me. I mean, I've, I've got a family now. I want to have more children and grow my family. I've, I've started my career. I've gotten some great experience in the United States. In fact, I want to start my own architectural practice here in Norway now. I'm back in, uh, outside of Oslo, in Lysaker, just outside of Oslo, living with my school, people I went to school with, my old friends and neighbors. Everything looks great. My, 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 my future looks golden. But of course, we know that the storm clouds are already beginning to form over Europe. January 1933, Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. He almost immediately starts persecuting the Jews, the communists, the social democrats. He immediately outlaws all the other political parties and basically seizes to complete uh, power in the country. Many of these Jews that he persecutes, they flee from Germany. Some of them go to Austria, but Germany annexes Austria in 1938. Some of them flee to Czechoslovakia. In fact, young Tommy Bergenthal was born in Czechoslovakia of parents who had fled Germany in 1933 to escape Hitler, figuring, well, when this Hitler madness blows over, we'll be able to move back. And of course, we know how that turned out. So you've got all of these refugees stuck in Central Europe. They've got no place to go. They can't cross borders to travel because they no longer have valid passports. First, their passports have, in most cases, expired. You have to get your passport renewed periodically, you know. In order to do that, you, go back, you have to go back to the country that issued them. And these Jews, who are most of their refugees, are not prepared to move back to Germany to get their um, passport renewed. On top of which, even if they were prepared to do that, they still couldn't get a passport because under the Nuremberg Laws of 1936, the Jews are not even considered citizens of Germany anymore. They're not entitled to a passport. So a number of prominent Norwegians come to Adnansen and they say there's a refugee problem in Europe and somebody's got to do something about it. And we've all discussed this and we've decided you're the person to do something about it. I mean, your name is Nansen. You're the son of the most famous man we've ever produced, the man who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1922. So we're looking to you for some leadership here. So Nansen reluctantly, somewhat reluctantly, I mean, you have to consider he's got a young family, He's got a fledgling architectural practice. And now people are asking him to essentially put all that aside and take up what is really kind of a hopeless task. But he agrees anyway, and he forms this organization called Nansen Yelpen, which means Nansen Relief, with the goal of helping some of these refugees get visas to come to Norway. Now, it was an uphill battle. The Norwegian government was very anti-Semitic at the time, as were the governments of the United States, Great Britain, France. All these countries sympathized with what was happening to the Jews. They felt bad for what Germany and Hitler were doing to the Jews. They weren't prepared to change their immigration laws to make it easier for Jews to get into their country. So Nansen struggles from 1936 to 1939 to get these visas for these refugees. By the time the war breaks out in 1939, he's successful in bringing about 260, 270 men, women, and children into uh, Norway. So to talk, to sum up a little bit about Nansen, we know that number one, he's famous. Nansen name, extremely famous. We know that he's educated. He's got a college degree when not that many people have a college degree. We know that he is artistic because he's an architect and both of his parents are artistic. We're gonna see some of his artwork, some of the sketches that he drew in, in prison uh, in, in some of these slides. And uh, we know that uh, he is a humanitarian. He's kind of following in the footsteps of his father who won the Nobel Prize for his humanitarian work. Nansen also had a pretty wicked sense of humor. And that comes through in his diary in, in, in many of his entries. It seems a little bit oxymoronic, I guess, or, or, or ironic to be talking about humor when you're talking about a diary written in a concentration camp. But I think Nansen used humor 
as a way of dealing with the horrors that he was experiencing. Some of you may be familiar with a man named Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, this is what Frankl says, humor was another of the soul's weapons in the fight for self-preservation. I think that's what Nansen used humor for. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples in his diary of Nansen's humor. Some of it is really subtle. It's almost, it, it's, I would say, more wit than humor. And if you read his diary too quickly and kind of race through it or read it too literally, I think you're almost, <clears throat> excuse me, liable to miss the point he's making. This first diary entry is from January 16th, 1942. This is three days after he's been arrested. And Nansen's talking about how he is turning in his civilian clothes, his mufti, and getting his prison uniform issued to him. And he writes, trousers and jacket, a shirt and a pair of boots were issued to us today by Henning Botker, who is in charge of the wardrobe. The jacket, <clears throat> excuse me, the jacket, the shirt and the trousers were too small for me and the boots unwearable. Everything else is all right. <laughs> There's another example. And this is one of my favorite diary entries of the whole book. This takes place in 1944, where Nansen's in Sachsenhausen, and he's talking about how this German SS officer works or, or, or is, takes up a position in their work squad every day to make sure the prisoners are doing their work. They called their work squads commandos. That was the word that they used uh, for all the different, you're in the, the this commando, the word chop, work wood chopping commando, the mechanical commando, whatever. So this is what Nansen writes. It's June 8th, 1944, he writes, the Unterscharfuhrer in this commando, and an Unterscharfuhrer would be the German equivalent of a sergeant in the U.S. Army, who shares my cubicle all day, thinks exclusively and all the time about girls and unfaithfulness. Last night, one of his wenches wrote on his cigarette case the words, I love you, but in English. Of course, he had no idea what they meant, so he asked me this morning. I told him they meant, kiss my arse. <laughs> His jaw dropped notably, and I let it drop. Now, why did Nansen write the diary in the first place? Of course, writing a diary in a concentration